There we go. Hi guys, and welcome to another dungeon video. Oh, we're getting we're getting pretty far in the dungeon videos. I, I completely forgot to mention this actually. Well, no, no, I didn't completely forgot to mention it. But um, in the previous dungeon video, we have got uh, this weekend that's starting now. I guess this doesn't really actually matter to you guys. But basically, after this weekend that we're doing now, we've got two dungeons. There is only one dungeon left. Okay, and that's like an elite dungeon right at the end of everything. Okay, I've not actually, and it's basically it's like four dungeons in one. It, it's kind of weird. I'm not sure specific how I'm going to be sorting that out but please if you want to be in the last dungeon the last elite dungeon that bear in mind it is an elite dungeon it's a harder thing to do then please please do feel free to leave a comment right now because I don't know whether just picking everyone as I have been doing it will work out so easily considering the fact that uh, it will probably be a lot bigger of a dungeon so do bear in mind that it's going to be a little longer but uh, get those comments rolling in I guess but hi guys and uh, let's continue on so we have got Arachne's Haunt uh, that we're going to be going to today but of course first we are going to be reading our master dungeon guide to see what happened last time we were in Ula's lab uh, again, not that much information, but it says, Ula, a reclusive Asura whose magical skills and achievements have made her nearly a legendary figure, once resided at the bottom of a labyrinth system of caverns. So this is really interesting. It's like, I don't know, you've got the three Asura, right? Ula, Zin, and Blim, and they all kind of worked around this lab. They're all originally from the lab, and Ula, particularly during Eye of the North, she's this legendary character, this really important one for Golomancy, but in the end, it's, uh, it's as we've seen in the uh, Guild Wars Beyond stuff, it's Zin and Blim, and particularly Blim that end up making all the advancements, and she just falls into nothingness, which is really, really quite cool. It talks about a lab as being like a labyrinth system here, as if she doesn't actually operate in those sections of the lab anymore. I always was always under the impression that she went back to the lab after the event of Eye of the North, but hey, maybe not. Disdaining polite society, she sequestered herself in a hidden laboratory to continue her work in peace and quiet. When her fellow Asura needed her expertise in the battle against the destroyers, Ula rejoined them. With no one left to maintain the go golems that once guarded the lab, her creations went berserk. The only way to restore order was by tracking down the TPS regulator, the ultimate source of these major malfunctions. It doesn't even mention in the book about Jien, the guy that we've been there. It makes me think that maybe this page was written before he was even in the story. But there was a looter there who was kind of turning the golems against us and we kind of raced him down there it was pretty cool and uh, and yeah that was a pretty cool dungeon so today we're going to be going to Magus Stones this is going to be the last uh, dungeon in the Tarnished Coast essentially and it's a section of the Magus Stones which I've never shown you before ever the only reason to come down here outside of exploring vanquishing and skill capping is to come to this dungeon down here there's no quests that take you down there nothing like that and it's a cool, pretty cool area so uh, I will be doing post commentary as we make that walk um, so I'll hand you over in a minute, and uh, when we get there, I'm pretty sure that's where you get the quest. I'm almost 100% sure you get the quest just outside the dungeon. I may just quickly check that, actually. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. It looks it looks like uh, we do get the quest from just outside the dungeon. So I'll be porting over to Ratasoon. We're going to start the race. There's actually three tips. I, I zoned in today, and I was like, oh, there's not that many people there. That's cool. That gives me a chance to let some old faces actually come in. And uh, we've ended up having, like, three teams, which is quite interesting. But, yeah, okay, so I'll hand you guys over to my future self, and I hope you enjoy the video and the dungeon let's do it all right so uh, I've just cut here what you can see here I didn't do the whole walk just because it took us quite a while to do the whole walk you know I literally just mentioned that uh, this dungeon actually takes place in a part of the explorable area that we had never seen before um, well basically this part of the walk here is sort of that actual part that was fogged up there's not that much interesting really going around in this corner of the explorable area but I did feel a bit dirty cutting the whole thing out so I'm leaving some of it in this is like the last leg of the walk the only kind of cool thing that really I could mention around here is that uh, a there's a lot more of those floating rocks and they only appear sort of down there near the water if you remember I talked about like that water theory a while ago with all the sort of the levitating stuff which is quite cool and um, obviously the other thing here as well that some of you might know about is um, outside the dungeon the dungeons very much to do with spiders right it's called Arachne's horn okay it's very much to do with spiders and outside the dungeon very close outside it we actually kill the guy at least I think we killed the guy, if I remember rightly. I don't know, it was a while ago we did this. But uh, there's a boss down here as well who um, actually tames himself. Uh, a Black Widow spider. And those spiders, if you remember from the Underworld series, those are like really rare. They were like the prestige pet from the game's launch. And the only time, the, the only place you could ever get them in the game was there. Well, what actually happens here is you get a guy that tames one. One of the bosses has got it as a pet. And what's quite cool with Guild Wars is what I mentioned recently in the uh, Warring Crytor stuff about how you can sort of flag heroes around to 
stop things from spawning, like they can move to areas before they've spawned. What you used to be able to do, which was really cool, it's been, it's since been patched, but what you used to be able to do was flag your heroes over to where the guy would spawn, walk in range so he'd spawn, but where basically the, the way the AI works is for him to have his pet, he has to tame the spider, but if you flag your heroes over there, you can kill him before he successfully tames it, and then there's just a tameable Black Widow wandering around, which you can tame for yourself, and it was a really easy way to get what was quite an elite endgame pet. Later been fixed, but whatever. So anyway, here at this resurrection shrine, you can see the portal just there up there on my mini map. You can find three Asura, and these Asura are the guys that give you the quest that takes you through the dungeon. They're pretty hard to miss, and just like with any other dungeon, obviously you will want the quest if you're going to go through. I can't remember what it is that blocks you off in half these dungeons, but most dungeons, if you don't have the quest, I'm not sure if I made this clear, if you don't have the quest that goes with the dungeons, there's a point where you can't get through like a gate or something like that. So, uh, so yeah, I I've been rambling through the dialogue box, so this isn't going to sync up properly, but uh, the intro dialogue reads as such. It's, it's someone called Hicks, and he says, You're a sight for sore eyes, Booker. Arachne's haunt is home to the powerful veins of energy we need in our defences against the destroyers. We've been fighting an unending battle against the matriarchs, and are in need of some reinforcements. These spiders lay large egg sacs and spin webs that no normal fire can burn through. They've enslaved other nasty beasts to help protect their brood. Manp See, that's M-A-N-P, and when I say it out loud, it sounds no different to Mamp, who is another Asuran character. Anyway, he developed a superheated staff capable of doing the job. I'd find you one, but the last troops that went in took the remaining ones. I'm sure you'll find what you need on their bodies. And um, we can say, we'll burn everything, it's the only way to be certain. So, it's, uh, and the decline is, and just how long after we're declared overdue can we expect a rescue? Now, uh, what's quite cool about this is uh, this staff, basically, that as you go through the dungeon, it doesn't happen as much as I remember, but uh, there's, like, big sort of blocked off passageways as you'll see when we get in there um, with all these webs and you can use this staff to burn that your way through the thing is it will catch you out if you're not careful if you're going to play through these dungeons while watching this video or after watching it make sure you bring the staff with you because I remember when I used to play through it the first two, few times I played through it shamefully both in normal mode and hard mode I'd drop the staff and be like alright I've burnt my way through fine we'll leave well the game's not decent enough to give you another staff later along so you can like end up going nearly the whole way across the dungeon floor and then you need to walk all the way back to get the staff again so do watch out for that that's, that's that's something that you do need to watch out for actually in a few dungeons, like the same kind of thing can happen in Shards of War 2. But anyway, it's a cool mechanic, and then later on you'll see actually we start to burn these egg sacks to spawn bosses which you can kill to get keys to continue on. It's a dungeon I like, I really like it, but only because... Um, and this is this is really weird. I, I doubt many people share this, but when I when I was younger, one of the first RPGs I got really into was a game called uh, it was Might and Magic Six, and it's it was a different. It was kind of a first person RPG series, but you were first person but controlling an entire party. It was very odd, but they, they were amazing games, right? They were so cool. But um, but Might and Magic Six, I always remember there was a big dungeon, a big spider cave, like the Spider Temple near the start. And I, it, for some for whatever reason, Arachne's Haunt has always reminded me of that. I've always liked it. It's one of what people for a long time before sort of seven heroes came out and lots of things came out was actually one of the harder dungeons in the game but that doesn't really mean anything these days because it's so much easier to get through everything but you know if you're playing through do bear that in mind people do still I suppose consider this to be one of the hard ones uh, so yeah do watch out for that I, I think it's very good to bring like MMs and stuff on it but uh, in any case we did really well I think you know everybody who came on this dungeon was absolutely fantastic considering it's one of the last ones we're doing I was really happy with how it went through we were as you can see there actually there's some gins on the screen we were all gonna do like this or in some things I I've started asking at the start of every dungeon episode, like, oh, has anyone got any Asuran summons just in case? Uh, sort of the majority of the people in the party have, and we could do it. Um, but rarely does that end up how it is. And I actually noticed when I was going into Arachne's Haunt, Matt Greenspring isn't Tom Bluewood, so he hasn't got any of the, the skills anyway, because I haven't been got off my arse and gone and got them. So, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure that won't be happening in the end. But still, there were a couple, I think there were at least two Jin here, which was quite cool. There were actually some Jin you fight later in the dungeon as well, and I was getting a bit confused about which was which. But in any case, uh, that's the dungeon. It was very fun. I hope you enjoy the, uh, the footage going on in the background. Um, so yeah, I, I've just got in from work. We're going to be doing a blog post, and uh, and it's not going to be what I thought it was going to be though, because we last left off. Okay, oh, I'm actually I'm so excited. You're going to get a little bit of a taste here of what I'm like uh, when new information comes out. So when we last left off, it was April 2011, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. This was Char Week, April 2000. I don't know. We finished April, didn't we? We went off into uh, May because in May this was where the crate came. Hold on, let me just. Yeah, yeah, so in May, we were in May 2011, we learned about the crate and Lion's Arch and stuff. Uh, we're skipping forward to January 2012, because I just got home from work, and uh, I, I, 
I checked what was going on, I looked at my comments and stuff, and it turns out Arena Net have just released a new blog post, hell yeah, so, um, in fact they've released two blog posts, one was about the beta, uh, which by the way, before we get into this, I do, I do feel the need to say actually, um, they, if you look on the forums, you can actually look at the posts that devs have said and stuff about the beta, something interesting that some of you might not know, it's not well known, and this is something that, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna go out and say, I, I've been saying this for a long time, I thought this was what, what Arena Net were gonna do, um, instead of being a traditional beta as a lot of you might be thinking it's going to be it's not going to be free to play for as long as you want until the beta is over it's not like that at all it's going to be like what they did with guild wars 1 which were open weekends or sneak peek weekends or preview weekends whatever you want to call them basically what it will be is over from like march april maybe even may i, I don't think it will last three months though but over those months in particular it'll be like the weekends um you'll be able to play sort of the game and the servers will be open for that period and then they'll sort of shut down again that's what they did with guild wars 1 and I think it's a brilliant plan. I, I always thought they were going to do it with Guild Wars 2 because looking at their business model, you know, it's subscription fee-less. If they just let people play it as long as they possibly wanted for free at the start, you know, there's no, I see no reason why real hardcore people wouldn't just exhaust all the content straight away and then just decide that they weren't going to buy the game at all. And, you know, ArenaNet really are relying on those box sales at the start. So I think it's cool. I'm, I'm happy with the sneak peeks. Plus, you know, the, the main thing, obviously, with a beta, I think... Well, especially when you're, you're doing a game that's sort of very non-standard and it's doing a lot of new things and stuff like that. I think it's quite important that the features are actually tested properly and with a lot of people. And what they do by obviously putting it down to weekends, especially you know, especially because it's weekends because this is the time most people play, ha have to play games, it really does stress test the game. That's what the bait is for, really. It's to stress to test the game, not let everyone exhaust all the content and then get bored and leave. It's just to make sure the servers can handle stuff and make sure all the new features they've implemented, like the dynamic events, are scaling properly and stuff like that. So, really good move, but uh, yeah, that's, that was also announced. So, that was uh, the other d blog that came out. But anyway, yeah, I came home from work, and uh, a new blog post has come out. Okay, get ready, here we go. January 2012, the savage pride of the Joe Tun. Right, and I was sitting there on my walk home from work. I was like, right, I'm doing the, the dungeon commentary today. I'm doing the dungeon commentary today. Got home, and I found out there was a new blog post, and I haven't read the blog post. I thought, you know what? I'll try and do like a live first impressions reading of this thing. And I don't know how this will go because this will be the first time I read this. I'm going to be doing comment. I'm going to be reading it out loud as I go. So this will be literally the first thing I think of it. It might not be what my opinions end up being in the end, and I'll probably miss a load of interest and stuff that if I'd had time to think on it, I would have gone through. But do you know what? I'm, I'm going to read it out and. We'll see how it goes. I'm really excited about this. It's called the Savage Pride of the Jotun. There'll be a link in the description. Uh, and yeah, so the Jotun, and we got a nice little bit picture of some uh, concept art of some mountains there. Um, before we go in, we may, I may as well just say sort of what I know very briefly about the Jotun so far. The Jotun were a race that were primarily introduced in, in Eye of the North. Obviously, we saw them in a lot of caves. They were people that lived up in the northern ship, the far Shiver Peaks. Sorry, I keep calling them the northern Shiver Peaks recently. I don't know why. But there were people that lived up there. There were lots of hints about them maybe having been a fallen race that once had these big cathedrals and stuff like that. That was going on in the Eye of the North um, manuals. And there were some interesting, a, a couple of cool quests to do with them. But generally, they did seem like a fallen race that seemed to have just sort of uh, lost whatever they once were and are now sort of very tribal and, and stupid and thick but it was always really cool to see the dynamic between them and the Norns but aside from that really we, we didn't know that much else about the Jotun I, I, they've always been very mysterious so I'm really hoping that oh and look this is written by Rhi as well I think they're all written by Rhi they must be but yeah so I'm hoping this will sort of elaborate maybe a bit on the cathedrals and stuff like that and hopefully I mean they've written a whole blog about it so who knows we do know they're in Guild Wars 2 obviously but uh, alright so let's do it um, but rewrites the Jotun pronounced... See, and they've got written here, Jotun again. But they've got like an accent over the O. And then a dash and then ton. And I don't know, like, some people call it Yotun. This is... If you've watched my other North Let's Play, you'll know that I don't know how to say it. And I, do, I swap all the time. But the Jotun pronounced Yotun are the last remnants of an ancient society of du of giants. Sweet. Okay, so cool. They're, they're, they're sticking with their guns. This is the story they established and they're staying with it. There's no retconning going on here. Uh, once powerful, advanced and arrogant, they proclaimed themselves rulers of the Shiver Peak Mountains and raised great monuments to themselves on the highest peaks. I wonder how long ago we're talking right now. Like, are we talking way before the gods, like Massart Seer times, Dwarf times? I, I assume so. Uh, their leaders, known as Giant Kings, were tremendously powerful beings, as skilled in feats of strength as they were in magic and lore. Huh, okay, that's quite cool. Because, like, we've seen that the Jotun, the, the, they really are, they're just big brutes, they're idiots, right? But, okay, alright. And I guess they, there are Jotun spellcasters in Guild Wars 1, but you never... 
And the thing is, Magic in Guild Wars 1 is never explicitly said like this, but it, it always kind of gives the impression that the arcane arts and stuff, those are for the more learned members of the races and stuff like this, and people like the Graw, they don't really care for magic, and, you know, if it wasn't for the fact Guild Wars, in order to be balanced, it, it was balanced around a healer being there for a specific team, I don't think the Graw would have any magic casters at all. The only ones you ever see, if, if I remember rightly, I'm pretty sure about this, are, the, are their monks. The rest of them are just, like, hammer wielders. So, you know, I think they do kind of do this kind of thing. While the Jotun did have a fair few caster races, I guess. So that, that's still kind of there, I suppose, in Guild Wars 1. Um, and yet, as the Jotun defeated all who threatened their control over the mountains, they did not adjust to peace. They sound a little bit like the Char there. Convinced that they were the superior race, they became obsessed with the purity of their blood and the number of heroes, warlords, and giant kings in each lineage. Blood became a reason for taking one mate over another, seizing land and, in time, wiping out other lesser tribes. Alright, okay, well, before we. If they had that kind of philosophy, why did they die out? Eventually, the Jotun conquered or destroyed all their external enemies, and the, and the then giant kings turned on each other. Oh, I see, turned on each other, each seeking ultimate control. Families waged war upon one another, and brother made war upon brother, until the tribes erupted in vicious internal wars for control. This is exactly the, like the Char. I bet these guys are like the Char, except while the Char kind of flukily, let's be honest here, kind of flukily managed to get out of these times of turbulence and, and found some kind of, although, un, although unstable, alliance with one another, like forming their war bands and stuff, the, the Jotun, I, I guess, didn't, because like we, we already established with Char Week that the only reason Char survived is because they always had that external threat. It just said here, the Jotun was so badass, they conquered or destroyed all of their external enemies. Brilliant. Okay, we got a quote here from someone called Thrum, the last of the giant king. Ooh, the last of the giant kings. Okay, he says, I will show you the Jotun of ages past. When we strode across the Shiver Peaks as, as mighty lords, witness the savagery, greed, and vanity that ended our glorious rule. That's so cool. So he's, he's like, I'm guessing he's speaking, most of these quotes are sort of from characters around Guild Wars 2's time. So we're talking about 250 years forward. I guess this guy's still alive. So the last giant king is still alive, maybe? or we've just found this quote maybe in a dusty old tome or something and he was talking oh that's so cool if he's a character we meet that that must be that's awesome okay cool so uh, so they do know who they were and uh, actually you know there's a massive thing they can speak and he, he can speak quite coherently didn't we see them like grumble just as brutes basically before but nothing much more than that um okay Long ago, the Jotun possessed the ability to use magic and was skilled enough with it to create enchanted monuments in the in, in the Shiver Peak Mountains. No way! No way! Some hero historians believe the age of Jotun magic may even predate the coming of the human gods and the creation of the blood. Amazing. Okay, so they are an old race. Wait, 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 wait. Are they going to expand on this? Enchanted monuments in the Shiver Peak Mountains? We're all, we're all thinking of the Eye of the North. Surely, surely. And then the, the eye, the eye actually, I've not done it yet, but in Winds of Change, that kind of comes, not Winds of Change, sorry, Hearts of the North, that kind of comes back into the story there a little bit. And I, I kind of had this little, th I wanted to mention it, obviously, when we get there, that Arena Net do still have their eye on it. When, when we started over the North, I talked about how it was this mysterious place. Did I actually pose the idea that it could have been the... I know I posed the idea that the Massart could have built it. I know a lot of people were thinking that. But the Jotuns as well, I think I might have mentioned that at one point because, you know, of their huge... Oh, that's amazing! If the if the Eye of the North was built by the Jotun, that just works so per... It must! Think of it! Think... Oh, that's brilliant. Okay, so that's actually canon now. I do remember th some theories about it. That's so cool. Alright, so their, their, their magic predates the creation of the Bloodstones. This is why the, the scrying pool was so weird, I suppose. Why it was so different from anything else we'd experienced in Guild Wars. Um, yet, during their long history of infighting, civil war, and slaughter, the Jotun lost all knowledge and understanding of magic. See, that's a bit weird as well, isn't it? I did just think that, actually, about how they were put good with magic. What about in Guild Wars 1? What, are we just kind of saying that's gameplay and not lore here? Uh, their powerful sage... I can't believe they built the, the, the Eye of the North. That's amazing. The Hall of Monuments. That's so cool. Their powerful sages were killed, and their lore keepers and mystics were wiped out before they could continue the tradition of Jotun magic. So what, they had, like, the ability to... What, what Let's think of... What does the scrying pool do, though, really? It shows you things you shouldn't really be able to see. Does it show you the future? Ah, oh, you see, the, the, there's so much talk as well, you know, about Baltec back in Istan, about how you had Baltec there, and he had all these talks about water, and he seemed to be hinting at something like the scrying pool. 
Which, of course, when that law that he when that was all written, ArenaNet were referring to whatever law they had written for Utopia, which may or may not be scrapped at this point, or it may have been re moved, sort of transitioned into what we saw in the Eye of the North. That's kind of, what does the scrying pool do? It definitely isn't god magic, though, is it? All that remains of their once great arcane spirituality are a few carved runes on forgotten, snow-covered peaks. <sighs> See, to, uh, there it sounds like they're hinting again. At, um, they, they talked about it in an interview, well, a long time ago now, I guess. But they do talk about in interviews about that how for the people who really care about the story, the people like you and me, we, we'll be able to go in game and see these ruins and stuff, and we'll be able to find stuff and hints of lost uh, lost civilizations and stuff. And I guess that hey, hello, this is this is one of them, and this is quite cool as well because I'm. I'm not a massive fan of snowy areas, you know, I like my fantasy games definitely and I, I, I really like having different environments and I do think that obviously having a snowy or a mountainous area brings a lot to the table, it adds a bit of variety, but aside from that I'm not like a massive fan of the aesthetic of it, I just tend to think, oh rocks and snow, big whoop, right? And I honestly, of all the areas in Guild Wars 2, the Shiver Peaks are the area I, I care least for, right? I, 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 and I think that might have had a bit of a knock-on effect with the Norn as well, I suppose. But this idea of like runes and stuff out on the peaks, that's that's cool. That's cool. I like that. Adds a bit of intrigue, a bit of, you know, the idea of going up, seeing a mountain and be like, oh, I want to get up there. And you get up there and you get a bit of a reward. You find some some runes. And don't forget, don't forget as well, there was a blog post. I haven't read it out, but there was a blog post about the Crichton language and about how you can translate the language. And indeed, uh, that, that blog post mentioned that Crichton wasn't the only language in Guild Wars 2. It wasn't the only one. You could translate other ones. Maybe this is going to be one of them. How cool is that? That's brilliant. Okay. All right. Uh, we got uh, a bit of concept art there of a Jotun looking as brutish and mean as ever. He's actually got quite a cool axe there, actually. Uh, but we got that, and then another section called Recent History. 